chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, I'm going to read three verses there, 1 through 3, and then we're going to turn our attention to Philippians chapter 4, as well as verse 9. Hebrews 11, beginning at verse 1. If you dare say amen. 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 Reading from the ESV <coughs> translation this morning. Now faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. For by it the people of old received their commendation. By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God, so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9. Philippians 4 and verse 9. You're about to work your way backwards on that one. Amen. Just before Colossians. Amen. Kind of help somebody. Amen. The word of God. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. What you have learned received and heard and seen in me. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace, the promise of God's word will be with you. You may be seated in the presence of our God. Join us in the length and breadth of this place here as we lift up our petitions to our God. And as always, pray, and it is my hope that you will pray so that you might receive, meaning that you believe it. For when you doubt, you will surely do without me. Let my Father begin. Father, 
Father, we thank you for who you are in our lives. It's beyond our comprehension what you've done for each and every one of us. Not only in forgiving us of our sins, but also in making us your spiritual children. We understand enough to know that of ourselves we are not even worthy. So thank you for the honor, the privilege to stand. Thank you for the hope that we have in you. Thank you for the joy and the total sufficiency of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Enlighten our minds this morning by your Holy Spirit and grant us that reverence and humility without which no one can understand your truth. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Give me eyes to see where spiritual battles are being waged in my life and time. Give me wisdom to see your truth. Courage now to speak your word as I must and patience to allow you to shape me and all of us into a person who can be effective yes, Lord, in the service of your kingdom. Yes, Lord. In the words of the saints of old, breathe on us, O yes, breath of God. Lord. Fill us with life yes, anew yes, that we may love like thou dost love and do as thou would do. And because we're not a selfish people, bless our neighbor on the left, bless our neighbor on the right, bless our neighbor in front of and behind us because we want all of our neighbors to be wonderfully blessed, stretched, but more than anything, challenged by your word. Let now the words of my mouth and meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. In Jesus, precious name I pray, that matchless, marvelous, majestic, magnificent, mighty name of Jesus we pray. Come on, help me say amen. Amen again. Amen. One more time. Give God a hand clap. Praise. In the words of that great Apostle Paul, as always found in Galatians chapter 2, a passage of scripture that become near and dear to me. For I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh. I live by none other than the faith of the Son of God who loved me so much that he gave himself for me. Thank you so much to our media as well as those of you who are standing in the gap on this morning as ushers. We greet you as always in that matchless, marvelous, majestic, magnificent, mighty name of our Lord and Savior. Amen. The one true God, Jesus the Christ. Amen, Lord. Amen somebody. Amen. 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 Amen somebody. We are, uh, we, we haven't been, and I'm, I'm, I'm not even starting yet, but we haven't been, one thing I neglected to tell you is we haven't been recording since the beginning uh, of service. We, we've just been posting the message. We're going to allow for all of December to help us to tweak some things. Amen. And then beginning in, uh, yeah. Matter of fact, we're going to use that time starting next Sunday to tweak some things. Mm -hmm. So that gives us those four Sundays to start getting ready uh, so that we don't have to do too much editing. Mm -hmm. Amen. But I want us to always be at our best. Okay. Amen. You ought to come prepared Amen. for worship. Amen. I want to lift up from this passage of scripture that the Lord has given us, Hebrews 11, 1 through 3, as well as Philippians 4 and verse 9, uh, the final part to this series that we have been on, and that is getting back you know, to the spiritual activity of living by faith. Getting back to the spiritual activity of living by faith. Getting back to the spiritual activity, the thing we used to do perhaps prior to a pandemic, getting back to the spiritual activity.
activity Amen. of living by faith. Brothers and sisters, I, I cannot speak for all pastors, but I can tell you that every pastor who has been in the trenches of pastoral care, that is the emotional and the spiritual care of God's people, is always reflective of uh, whether the church is where she should be and whether she's headed in the right direction. And if not, that pastor wants to know why. Uh, these times of reflection are more inward than outward because God's manservant spends time seeking God on the people's behalf to hear what the Spirit in the Word has to say about a burning in his heart. Uh, this series that we've been on getting back to the spiritual activities of the church was birthed from that sacred place. That's the place where the spirit in the word revealed the truth of why the church tends to get stuck, complacent, lackadaisical, and even stagnant in the work of the Lord. Uh, obviously, obviously, there are many reasons for this sort of thing, but Suffice it to say, the Spirit in the Word makes clear to all of us, that's my hope that it will for you, the fact that we need to do better uh, when it comes to the spiritual activities of the church. Uh, better in our attendance of the Lord's house, better in our study and preaching of God's Word, uh, better in our worship of God, better in our service related to God's work. And, and, and in this fifth part of our series, better in the practice of our faith in God. So as the Spirit gives strength and liberty this morning, I, I would like to just spend the next few minutes talking to all of us about getting back to the spiritual activity of living by faith. I don't know about you this morning, but I find it interesting that the Bible never presents a complete definition of the word faith. Our text that we've tagged and targeted for this preaching moment provides the best explanation that any of us can find. From a practical standpoint, faith consists of taking God at his word and acting accordingly. Faith develops assurance about things which do not yet exists. It also provides a conviction of certainty when it comes to what we do not see. Uh, the idea of being sure provides a conviction that what we hope for will certainly happen. Not because we can make it happen, but because God has said it will happen. Uh, to put it in a way that might help you better understand the faith I would ask that you consider something that is near and dear to each of us, our physical eyesight. Just as physical eyesight, meaning the ability to see, provides evidence about visible things, faith provides evidence about the invisible. As Christian believers, we are aware that God has promised future blessings and eternal rewards, but none of us have seen these yet. Still, we are certain God will deliver on his promises. And we will one day see and experience these things and rewards. That's what faith does for us. It proves the reality of what you and I cannot see. It enables, it enables, it enables the true child of God to live obediently now in the light of what we know in faith will come. Faith gives the Christian a platform for hope, meaning expectation, and a perception into the reality of what would otherwise remain unseen. Uh, Deacon McNair, that's what we see here in this brief exposition of those who had faith and kept their soul. Uh, Donald Guthrie, in his contribution to the Tyndale Commentary, and Hebrews chapter 11 makes the point that the writer of our text was thinking of faith in general and not specifically Christian faith. 
revealing some of the qualities that are there for both the pre-Christian and the Christian of today. That's the continuity that we are blessed to see between the Hebrew Christians and the pious men of old. Their exploits are a fitting prelude to early Christians and an example for us all that you and I can live by faith. By learning from these champions of faith. Faith enabled them to claim God's promises and experience for themselves the joy of being saved. This should not surprise any of us since the time of the Bible and all throughout history there have been men who relegated or at least I would say here relegated faith to different things that they experienced in life. The four that I'm thinking about happen to be graduates of Morehouse University in Atlanta. Men like C.T. Walker, who more than anyone else, related faith to personal transformation. Men like Benjamin Elijah Mays, who more than anyone else, related faith to education. Men like Howard W. Thurman, who more than anyone else, related faith to the formation of the human community. And then men like Martin Luther King Jr., who more than anyone else lived, who more than anyone else who lived rather than Jesus Christ, related faith to the supremacy of love and the necessity of a nonviolent social revelation as well as social revolution. The experiences of these men teach us that a person with faith is a person who lets the unseen realities from God provide a living, effective power for daily living. Uh, Brother and sister, I'm simply trying to help you to understand that we have no excuse for not being able to live by faith. Some years back, I read an article about the captain of a large vessel who set sail with his family from Liverpool. His destination was New York. One night, one night, Chris, while everyone was asleep, a sudden squall had arose. The wind came sweeping over the water, struck the vessel, and almost capsized it. Everything movable was sent tumbling and crashing, and passengers became aware that they were in imminent danger, and perhaps even imminent peril. Everyone was alarmed, and many sprang from their berths and began to get dressed. The captain's daughter, this little eight-year-old girl at the time, was awakened, and she cried in fear. What's going on out there? They told her about the storm, but the only thing that concerned this child was whether her daddy was on the deck. Assured that he was, this eight-year-old child is said to have dropped back onto her pillow without a fear. Despite the howling winds and the crashing waves, she was soon fast asleep. That ought to be the attitude of every Christian this morning as we face the rough seas and stormy days of life in this pandemic. The Bible tells us that we are to live by faith. Mark chapter 11 and verse 22, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 4. You and I are reminded that faith is to be the daily lifestyle of every Christian, every true child of God. When we read Romans chapter 14, verse 23, we learn that anything that isn't a part of, of this faith life is a sin. In verse 6 of our text here in chapter 11, we see that without this quality called faith, uh -huh. we will never be able to please God. In Ephesians chapter 2, 8 and 9, we know that we are saved by faith. But just how do we go about living every day of our lives by faith? Uh, thank God the Bible church does not leave us in the dark concerning this matter. Getting back to the spiritual activity of living by faith means for us this morning it first and foremost, being aware of the lies surrounding faith. That's the first thing. You see, these are the things that faith is not. For instance, faith is not a blind leap. I realize that there's some who feel that a life lived by faith is the life of a fool. They speculate that faith is nothing more than a leap unto the dark. However, faith is much more than just walking around blindly, waiting for providence to somehow bump into you one day. Faith is your response to the promises, amen, that God has made for your life. In other words, God says, I will lead you. And faith responds, I will follow. God says, I will feed you. And faith responds, I will sure of eat. 
God says, I will meet every single one of your needs, and faith as far as is already done. Faith is never a lead into the dark. Faith is always based upon the firmest of foundations, which is, by the way, the word of our God. Hebrews 11 and verse 1 is that strong foundation. It says to us that you don't just pin your hopes up in the air and hope against hope now that everything will turn out all right. It says to us that the person who really walks in faith never walks through life blindly because that person always knows what's ahead. Faith, faith is not a blind leap, church. And then faith is not a blank check. The name it and claim it philosophy of our day that swept through the church has fooled a whole lot of people into thinking that if they want something from God, all they have to do was just pray about it and believe it and then just wait for it to happen. This caused a lot of people to become discouraged in their faith, disappointed with God because he didn't do it like they were told he would do it. But faith, church, is not a blank check. God is not our little cosmic Santa Claus just waiting for us to just place our orders and then drive away with anything and everything that our hearts desire. The implications of this way of thinking is that if this is true, then God is no more than a genie in a bottle who has no other purpose than to grant our wishes by the thousands. So I think it's important to remind all of us this morning that this charismatic name it and claim it crowd have missed the mark. God is about far larger and greater things than just waiting for me, waiting for you to come up with a few uh, wish lists and want things that we want on our wish list. Faith church is not a leap or a blind leap. It's not a blank check. And then faith is also not a bad choice. Regarding this bad choice, that those who would say to all of us that it's foolish to walk in total and utter dependence upon God. These people argue that God is an unknown kind of God. That he's an unseen force with which man cannot ever interact and have fellowship with. They call the Christian who lives by faith a fool. But can I tell you that the child of God who determines to truly live their life by total faith in the heavenly father will never be disappointed with God. No, with a struggle through life blindly. When you determine to truly live your life in total faith in God, there will be a deep, settled assurance that God is in an absolute control of everything you will ever go through in this life. And that's His will for your life will always be accomplished for your greater good. As, as believers here, we can either choose to please God or we can choose to please ourselves. That's your choice. If we are determined that we are going to please God, then we are going to have to walk by faith in Him, in His Word, and in His will for all of our lives. That there, these are the few of the things that faith is not. So getting back to the spiritual activity of living by faith means being aware of the lies surrounding faith. And then notice in verse 1, we see that it means also learning the truth surrounding faith. You have to know the lies before you know the truth. Being aware of the lies surrounding faith is important because it's the first step towards learning the truth surrounding faith. I heard Paul say in Romans 12 and 2, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. We, we come in here with a whole lot of preconceived notions. We come with a whole lot of opinions. About one thing or another. But the word of God said, be not conformed to this world. I understand how you get it out there. But when you come up in here. Up in here. Up in here. I need you to understand that there's only one way on how to do things. Do I have a witness out there? So, so be not conformed to this world. But be willing to be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That, that old way, that tricky way, that deceitful way, that wicked way of thinking, I want to change it now. So that you can think in the right way now. Do things the right way now. That you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of your Father, which is in heaven. Your other daddy, it was down there. But the daddy 
daddy you listen to now is the one up there. That's why when you pray, you pray, our oh, Father, who are up there and not down here. I wish I had a witness in here. Do I have a witness? Yeah, you, you got to understand that it's the first step towards learning the truth about faith. If faith is none of these things that I stated earlier, then exactly what is faith? That's the work I have to sit with. Faith is defined here and described by what we see in verse 1. The writer of Hebrews said that faith makes things that are hopeful as real as the things that are. And it provides the unshakable evidence of those things that are ours because of our relationship to Jesus Christ. Somebody missed that already. Being in the right relationship with Jesus Christ. In, in other words, it brings the future within the present and makes the invisible seen. Thank God this morning the author of Hebrews again did not leave us in the dark concerning what all this sureness and certainty were to be based upon. Notice in verse 2, the writer speaks of the elders and said that by their faith, they earned a good report from God. Then he goes on to speak of their faith, and it's here that I, I want you to notice that in every instance, either stated or implied is the promise from God. Notice in verse 3 that the creation account is reliable to all of us because it is based upon the word of God. Notice in verse 4 that he will offer a more pleasing sacrifice because of faith in a promise. Notice in verses 5 and 6 that Enoch received the first plane ride to heaven because he had faith in the promises of God. Notice in verse 7 that Noah built the ark and survived the flood because his faith floated on the promise of the Lord. Notice in verse 8 through 19 that Abraham left his home and his country, sojourned in a foreign land, offered his son up as a sacrifice to God, and looked at an eternal city. His faith was based on the unshakable foundation of the word of God. Notice also in verses 20 to 22 that Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph all died in faith, looking to the fulfillment of the promises that came from God. In verses 23 to 29, you'll see that Moses forsook Egypt, let Israel did the will of the Lord, and in response, he did it to the promise of God. Notice in verse 30 that Israel conquered Jericho because of faith in a promise that was made from God. Notice in verse 31 that Rahab, a prostitute, was saved because of her faith in the Lord's promises. Notice in verses 32 through verses 40 that so many down to the ages have responded to God's promises with faith and have seen him do greater wonders all because they trusted in the promise that came from God. So with these facts that we have here, these truths that we have here in mind, I could not help but wonder, church, what is faith? But I believe there's an answer for all of us here in our text. Faith is the assurance that God, again, will do exactly what he has promised to do. Anything based on guesswork, peace of heart, wishful thinking, mindfulness will end in failure. Did I mention that many people have become disappointed with God because he didn't do something they told him to? Don't miss what I said now. Can I tell you again, many people have become disappointed with God because God didn't do what they told him to. But, but we need to remember this morning that faith is not a lasso that you can throw around God's neck to make him do whatever you want him to do. In other words, your will. Faith is not based upon a button that we push to force God into doing what we want him to do. Many people have prayed for things they wanted or thought they needed and the requests were simply denied. Some became bitter against God. Some coming to church and no longer follow the Lord. Sometimes the things they prayed for were legitimate, like the healing of a relative, a new job, the solution to some problem they had. But when they forget that they haven't been given a clear promise from God concerning that situation, they are in for a whole lot of disappointment. Here's a little word of advice to all of us who are listening this morning. We can pray about anything we want to pray. Then we can also hope that it will come to pass. But we can only have faith in those things which God has already promised 
to bring the pass. You see, when I expect God to do as he has promised, that's faith. When I expect him to do as I wish or how it is that I want him to do it, that's just presumption. God will always honor the promise of his word. But I pray that a person will be healed. I can hope for it to happen because I know God has the power to heal anybody. But I really do not know what his will is for that person. I don't have his promise in that manner. When I pray for the safety of my children and my grandchildren, I can hope that they will be safe despite the fact that we are far away from each other. But I cannot have the absolute assurance that they will be saved. Because I still don't have God's word on this matter. That they will be saved. However, when God says it will be a certain way in his word, then you and I can count on it being just as God said it will. Therefore, anything that's promised in the Bible can serve as the basis for genuine faith. When it comes to our prayers of hope, oh yes, versus the prayer of faith, it's important to remember that when we pray that our neighbor will be saved, you and I can have faith that God will save you if they will turn to Jesus. However, we can only hope that they will be saved because at the end of the day, they may decide, amen, not to receive Jesus Christ. Likewise, when we pray that our needs might be met, we can believe that it will be met because God has already promised to meet every single one of our needs according to his riches in glory. That's the promise of Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. And that's the difference between prayers of hope versus the prayer of faith. Can I tell you again that faith is expecting God to do exactly as he has promised to do. Eastern's Bible Dictionary says that faith is in general the persuasion of the mind. That a certain statement is true according to Philippians 1 and 27. Faith's primary idea is trust. We sing it, but do we mean it? I will trust. But do you really trust in the Lord? Because faith's primary idea is that you will trust in what God has said. If something or thing is true, it's worthy of trust. It admits of many degrees up to that full assurance of faith in accordance with the evidence of which those things, on which those things it rests. In this case, God's word. That's why knowledge is often associated with faith and is often an essential element in all of faith to the point of being equivalent to faith based on what John 10 and 38, where Jesus says, even though you don't believe, Jesus said, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me, and I am in the Father. The two are distinguished in this respect that faith includes in it assent, which is an act of the will in addition to the act of understanding. Assent, A-S-S-E-N-T, to the truth is of the essence of faith, and the ultimate ground on which our assent to any revealed truth rests is the veracity of God himself. If that does not do it for you, perhaps you should just look at it in this way. In case you missed it, historical faith is the apprehension of and assent to certain statements which are regarded as mere facts of history. Temporary faith is that state of mind which is awakened in men, as in the case of Felix, by the exposition of the truth that was preached to him and by the evidence of religious sympathy or by what is sometimes styled the common operation of the Holy Spirit, the move of the Spirit. And then there is also saving faith. So called because it has eternal life inseparably connected with it. It cannot be better defined than in the words of the assembly's shorter catechism wherein we see these words. Faith in Jesus Christ is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. The object of saving faith is the whole revealed word of God. To put it another way, faith accepts and believes it as the very truth, most sure, but the special act of faith which unites, unites rather each of us to Christ has as his object the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what Acts 16 and verse 31 tells us. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. You and your household. This is the specific act of faith by which a sinner like you and me is justified before God. 
as revealed in Romans 3 and 22. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness. Because in his divine forbearance, he had passed over former sins. That's what you'll see in verse 25. It's in this act of faith that the believer appropriates and rests on Christ alone as mediator in all of his offices. This trust and reliance is of the essence of faith. By faith, the believer directly and immediately appropriates Christ as his own. The minute you accept it, according to what God's word says, you are saved. Y'all ain't hearing me. When you believe, you are saved. You ain't got to work for it. You are saved. If you believe it in your heart, you are saved. Do I have a witness in here? Do I have somebody for me with Romans 10 and 9? Then thou shalt confess with thy mouth. Believe in the heart that God has raised him from the dead. Thou shalt be saved. Faith is the direct act when it comes to making Christ ours. It is not a work which God graciously accepts instead of perfect obedience, but it's only the hand by which we take hold of the person and work of our Redeemer as the only ground of our salvation. I like how Mark 16 and 16 tells it. It teaches that faith is necessary to our salvation, not because there's any merit in it, but simply because it's the sinners taking the place assigned to him by God. Is falling in with what God is doing in his life. The warrant or ground of which faith is the divine testimony, not the reasonableness of what God said, but the simple fact that God is the one who said it. Faith then rests immediately on, just said the Lord. But brothers and sisters, in order to act in faith, the veracity, sincerity, and truth of God must be owned and appreciated together with his unchangeableness. Make no mistake about it there. God's word encourages and emboldens every sinner personally to transact with Christ as God's gift to him or her. To close with him, to embrace him for who he is, to give ourselves to him and take Christ as our own. That word comes from the power for, for it's the word of God who has revealed himself in his works and especially in that place called the cross. God is to believe for his word's sake, but also for his name's sake. That's the truth surrounding faith. Getting back to that spiritual activity of living by faith means being aware of the lies surrounding faith. Learning the truth surrounding faith as seen there in verse 1. And then in Philippians chapter 4 and verse 9, we see that it means practicing the truth surrounding faith. Brothers and sisters, this morning as I stand before you, can't help but notice that after we are saved, uh -huh. there's a practice that should take place. Uh -huh. After we are saved, there's a practice that should take place. This practice has everything to do with our Christian living. And the Christian lifestyle others should see us always practicing. That's what Paul wanted these Philippian Christians to know and understand. He, he wants us to know the same thing today. That living by faith is in fact possible when we determine for ourselves to live according to his word. It's here in Philippians 4 and verse 9 that the apostle says, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And the God of peace, that's the promise, will be with you. As you practice, God will be with you. Every day of your life, as you live as a child of God, God has made the promise that he'll be with you. I, I, I can hear him saying it in Hebrews chapter 13. I will never leave you, nor forsake you. And, and I believe it, it, Paul is simply saying here that, that if you want to have a close relationship with God, if you want to have an experience of the fullness of joy and peace in your life, if you want to be truly blessed in your walk with a holy God, then, then he's encouraging us to live by faith. And, and, and he says you can do so by just following his example. This is not a braggadocio or pride 
as some would think, is the state of every Christian should practice living in a state of being an example for all who are observing us each and every day. Paul's example includes his teaching, the tradition he received from the apostles and passed on to others, his reputation for Christian living, and the Christian lifestyle that they saw him practice each and every day. That's what every true child of God should strive to do each and every day of their life. Just live by faith before others. That those of us who are not so much older in age, but older in Christ. And have walked faithfully with the Lord Jesus for a number of years now. And have grown to love and trust in the Lord with all of our hearts. And we don't only leave our own understanding. Oh yes, and we have grown to appreciate the work of grace in all of our lives. If you know my personal experience, I'm talking about folk who've been in the law for a few days now. If you know my personal experience, how good God is to you as you trust in him, then you should also be aware of others now in the faith who are at the same time looking up to you in your walk with him. Y'all ain't going to hear me here. You, you should always be aware that, that other people are watching your life. Yeah, folk are watching my life. As an example to be followed. Oh yeah, we may not think about much when we are younger or without any responsibility. But as you get older, church, and I can tell you, as you get older, church, uh huh, and, and more mature, there, there comes a point in your life, a point in your profession, when you become very conscious of what your example means to other people. And out of love towards them and reverence towards the Lord Jesus Christ, you take your role as an example consciously and very seriously. I wish I had a witness here, Mother. Uh, the Apostle Peter once wrote that this should be the true thing of all pastors. But I submit to you that it should not only be true of all pastors, but it ought to be true of every child of God to practice our faith, live as Christians before others, be an example to the flock. Each Christian should live in such a close fellowship with Jesus Christ and in such faithful obedience to God's word that they are able to tell others certainly with all humility and certainly with equally with full integrity here, look at my life. Uh -huh. Watch carefully how I live, DJ. Listen to how I talk. Uh -huh. Follow in my footsteps and then more importantly, do as I do. I challenge every servant leader in this house to not think of yourself as doing a job before people, but, but do what I've learned. Rather see yourself as living a life before people. Uh -huh. That's the same kind of challenge that Paul shared with a young pastor by the name of Titus. As he instructed him to faithfully teach the church family, Paul told him, but as you, for you rather, speak the things which are proper for sound doctrine. The things that Paul was talking about can be seen in verses 2 through the 8 part of verse 7 where Paul said that the older men might be so reverent and temperate and sound in their faith and in love and in patience. The older women likewise that they may be reverent in their behavior. They, they ought not be acting like some young girl. That, that old man ought not act like he's some gangster. Pull up your pants. Put a belt on. Act like you a grown man. Uh-huh, some act like you're a teenage boy. You're no longer that same person. You, you ought to be much mature, much more mature now. And, and stop talking about other people and being slanderous. Now, stop drinking so much. That's what the word said. Now, teachers are good things. And, and that, that they may be admonished to young men to love their husband. You, you can't show them uh -huh, and tell them, but you can show them better than you can tell them. I wish I had a witness in here. Uh, how will they know how to do things except they see you do the same thing? If, if you want that young child in your house to know how to be treated like a queen, you ought to make sure that the man that you're with treats you like a queen. I wish I had a witness in here. Uh -huh. You ought to make sure that you don't end up with somebody that got no business deal. You got to make sure you don't end up with somebody you ain't got no business deal with. Uh, I wish I had a witness here. Uh, I'm not going to diagnose the text too much, but I'm going to try to help somebody in this house. But whatever you do, I need you to set the example that the word of God may not be blasphemed. And then he said, likewise, exhort those young men who think they got so much going on, who think they're living their best life, 
uh, who think that they are it and nothing else. I wish I had a witness here. Tell them that they don't have to drink so much. Uh-huh. I know they feel good right now, but it's only a temporary thing. I know you can't see it right now, but it's going to tear you down. I know you can't see it right now, but you're going to get older before your time. I know you can't see it right now, but it's killing your liver. I know you can't see it right now, but it's making you drunk and you can't understand nothing. It's making you so drunk you can't even understand that you're a fool. I wish I had a witness in here. Do I have a witness in here? Tell them they ought to be sober-minded. And if it means that you got to put down the bottle in order to teach them, then you put down the bottle so that they can see a better example. They, they won't just say, well, you can't tell me unless you're going to show me, but you're going to show them better than you can tell them. Because they're witness in the house. Because you are now a pattern, according to what Paul says, of good works. Uh, a pattern of good works. Show them how to get up right early on Sunday morning to go to church. Show them that a man or woman ought not lay in bed on Sunday morning. That they ought to find their place in a church somewhere so that they can worship the Lord and thank him for how good God has been throughout the week. Is there a witness in this house? You, you should consider it a blessing that God has entrusted you with the wonderful privilege of serving as an example to other believers of how to walk with God. Practice. Practice. Practice some of the functions that faith performs in your life so that others who see it now, when they see it, they too cannot help but be encouraged knowing that what faith has done for you, they can do the same for them. All because you showed it. Some things you just don't have to talk about. Christian living ought to be lived. Tell me you're a Christian all day long. But I ain't listening to a word you say until I see how you walk. I just want to see how you walk. I don't care how high you jump on Sunday morning. I'm not even bothered by it. I'm not even looking at you when you go up. I'm waiting to see where your feet going to land and how your walk is going to be. Is there a witness in the house? You need to make sure that others see what they ought to see because of who you say you are. And they can be encouraged by it. Knowing that what faith has done for you, they can do the same thing for them. Practice how faith claims your fears. Let others see how you are not sheltered from bad things. Bad things will happen. But even though they happen to you, you have the promise of God's word. Can I tell you again? I will never leave you. <laughs> nor forsake you. Even though death shows up at your doorstep, you have the promise that ye know I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil. And here's why, because I know the Lord is with me. His rod and his staff is comforting me. He's preparing a table before me in the presence of all my haters. Y'all got some haters too. I just believe I got more than you do. Prepare the table before me in the presence of my enemy. Can I get a witness in here? I'm going to preach myself happy this morning. This is my last one in this series right here. But, but reminded of the promise and aware of the fact of his promise that all things still work together for the good to them that love the Lord. Anybody here love the Lord? According to his purpose. God knows the end long before the beginning, church. And no matter what he is allowed to come my way in his permissive will, he still has a divine will that what the enemy intended for evil, God has promised that he'll turn it around for my good. Do I have a witness in here? Anybody in here that has seen God show up in your life and then show up? Uh-huh. So God, you would never get back up again, but look at you and where you are right now. They thought you would have died by now, but look at you and where you are. God has seated you in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. You ought to raise your hand and tell the Lord, thank you. I should be dead right now, sleeping in my grave. But thanks be to God that he looked beyond all of my faults. And he saw my need, church. 
I wish I had somebody that would help me just preach this thing here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Faith calms your fears. And then faith also cushions your fall. Anybody ever felt before? Did it hurt? But that's all right, church. God has taught you how to get back up again. There's some get back up again folk in here. I wish I had at least three get back up people in here. Somebody that's been down before. You know how it feels. You know what it looks like. But thanks be to God that I no longer look like. I wish I had a witness in here. Yeah, 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 yeah. If any man be in Christ, new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I don't know how it feels like anymore to fall because I'm used to it now. Because when I fall, I just get back up again. Because that lets me know God ain't through with me yet. He hadn't given up on me yet. He hadn't thrown in the towel yet. He's still holding on to me. He's still helping me up. And I can't be help but be reminded of what the saints used to say. If he has to reach where, Jesus will pick you up. Can you get back up, people in here? Calls my fears. Faith will cushion your fall, church. And then faith also confirms your future. Anybody here know where you're headed? I'm not talking about the red lobster when you get out of here. I'm not talking about Papa Do's in Atlanta. I'm not talking about Houston's in Atlanta. I'm not talking about Cheesecake Factory, all the places we don't have here in Augusta. Uh, but, but I thank God that he gave us gas to be able to drive and eat what I want to eat. When I want to eat it, I wish I had a witness in here. But he confirms our future. May not know what we'll face on tomorrow. But we should know that when all of our tomorrows are finished, we have a future that's secured in the Lord Jesus Christ. I heard him say, if I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you may be also. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, Chris, I wouldn't have told you. But I go to prepare a place for you, that where I am, you too can be there. Is there a witness in here? And know that your faith will confirm your future. Oh, yes, it will, church. So it's my contention that this is what Paul was getting at earlier in Philippians chapter 3 and 17. When he wrote to those Philippians and said, Brethren, join me in following my example and not those who so walk as you have us as a pattern. I said it before and I believe it's worth mentioning again that Paul wasn't being braggadocious. Paul knew he was far from being a perfect man. Uh -huh. As a matter of fact, Paul had formerly been a vicious antagonist against Jesus Christ. He was a notorious persecutor of the church. But I'm here to tell you that by the grace of God, Paul became the chief example of what it looks like for a sinner to be saved by faith in Jesus Christ and to then rise up and walk in fellowship with a risen Savior. Listen to his own testimony in 1 Timothy chapter 1. Paul said, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. And although I was formerly a blasphemer, we've all been a whole lot of things. There's an ex-somebody in this house. He was a persecutor, an insolent man, but I, I, he obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which are in Jesus Christ. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom Paul says he was a chief sinner. However, for this reason, he says to us today, I obtain mercy. In other words, Paul is saying, I thank God for his mercy that in me first Jesus Christ might show all long suffering. If he can put up with somebody like me, God can show him to put up with somebody like you. So he says, as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. Paul didn't practice his faith because he thought he was an example in and of himself. Oh, Paul put things in perspective for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1 where he says, imitate me just as I also imitate Jesus Christ. And as difficult as the Christian life can be, it's also impossible unless we acquire the power to live it through Jesus Christ. To be sure, this truth is not something that comes naturally to any of us. 
It's something that must be learned and practiced. And that's why Paul wrote, as I close here, the things which you have learned and received and heard and you've seen it in me. I wish I had a witness here. Okay, can, I just, can I just make it personal here? Liberty after 20 years, the things that you have learned and received and heard and then saw more important than anything else in me. I can tell you today, that's like Paul did, these do. And then I'll tell you the promise, God will trust. Oh yes, he'll be with you. Notice, notice that first we got to learn the things taught by the word and then by practice also. And then second, we must receive these things as if God, from God himself. And it's for this decision Paul will go on to say at other times, for I received from the Lord that which also I delivered unto you. And church, now that we have received faith, what will you do with it? That's the challenging question this morning. Now, now, why? Now that you have received faith, what will you do with it? Brother Deacons, now that you have received faith, what will you do with it? Deacon says, now that you have received faith, what will you do with it? Media, now that you have received faith, what will you do with it? Ushers, now that you have received faith, what will you do with it? Members of liberty, now that you have received faith, what will you do with it? To our visitors this morning, now that you have received faith, what will you do with it? Will you practice faith by living and walking in faith? Or will you live in hypocrisy? Fake it to see if you ever make it. Lie to yourself until you start believing the lie that somehow you can live like the world as deep and Christian. I'll close with the challenge of Paul's words found in the previous verse. And it's here right here. Whatsoever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure. Whatsoever things are love. Whatsoever things are good report. If there be any virtue, uh -huh, and if there be any praise, think on these things. That's all I need you to do this morning. You ask what things, and I will do just like Paul. I'll say the same thing. The things which you have both learned, the things that you have received, the things that you have heard, and then more importantly, the things that you have seen me do. Do your best, Liberty. Do your best, Liberty. Do your best liberty, and then give your best liberty. Give your best in everything that you do, liberty. You ought to have that enthusiasm in everything that you do. You ought to be excited about everything that you do when it comes to the body of Christ. Not only do your best, not only give your best, but then I'll close with telling you, live your best. Live your best liberty. Live your best Christian life by doing your best and giving your best to God. Each and every opportunity that God gives you, which is every day, you ought to live it to your best. <laughs> and in the words of Lucille Campbell, if you don't mind, if when you give the best of your service, and this can only be to a few people here. Because not all of us have given our best. Come on, let's be honest. But when you make up in your mind to do your best, make up in your mind to give your best, make up in your mind to live your best, you can be mindful of these words by Lucy Campbell. If when you give the best of your service, <laughs> telling the world that the Savior has come, <laughs> be not dismayed. When men don't believe you, he understands. And he'll say, because of what you have done, well done. Isn't that what you want to hear? But in order to hear, well done. You have to have done well. Do your best. Give your best. And then live your best. I've seen the lightning flash. I've heard the thunder roar. I felt sins break us dashing, trying to conquer my soul. I, I, I sense this more as I get older. But I hear the voice of my Savior. I'm encouraged every day. 
saying, God, you're 57 now, but I'm not done with you. Still fight on. And I'm still fight on, living. And here's why, because he promised never to leave me, Sister Scott. Never to leave me alone. We've done as God has commanded of us. And as always, there's one thing. God birthed in me this series. Put me in a place of reflecting in terms of where we are and whether or not we are headed in the right direction. Don't let a pandemic be your excuse as to why you can't do certain things and why you have stopped doing certain things. What would happen if God stopped looking after us? What would happen if God stopped supplying every single one of our needs? What would happen if God stopped waking us up each and every morning? Father God, we thank you. We bless your name. We love you, God. We honor you for who you are. Thank you for your word. The Rima in every part of this series. Help us to appropriate now by faith the truth of what your word says and begin to walk in faith, to live in faith, to act in faith, to function in faith. We thank you right now in the blessed name of Jesus Christ. I know we normally do a call, an invitation for those of you that do not know the Lord in the part of your sins. And that's, that's still a good thing. Faith is always a good thing. But I'm not just addressing those of you who don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to address those of us who, who have not been giving our best. Who have not done our best. And church, let me tell you, we'll never get to a place where we're able to achieve that level anyway. But if you missed it, it ought to be about practicing it every day. Are you truly practicing or is it just at your convenience? Because if that's you, then you too need to come to the altar so that we can rectify, get back in a right relationship with God. You can't move forward without God revealing some things and you acting on it. Each and every day there's something that I'm aware of in my relationship with Christ. And when I sense or feel it in line of right, Ask God right away, forgive me and help me. Last night as I laid in bed, my wife was already there. And I held her and I got in bed and I just prayed for her. And I thank God for my wife. I don't know what happened, but I, I just got caught up in 32 years, baby, of, uh, of the blessing of her. And I fell asleep thanking God for her. I've been blessed and I'm thankful. And I know what God can and will do. And I just wish that others would try him at his word. <laughs> Faith comes by hearing church and hearing by the word. If you're here, you are one of those. Come now. There's this one who has come. Maybe there's another. I want to pray with you. God is sending you a word. A word that says, I want you to get it right because I, I want to use you better. Yeah. Because you know, use you in a way. Amen. You, you've allowed too many things to get in the way. You've used the excuse of a pandemic to keep you from being your best. In the service of the Lord. But be mindful of how good God has been to you. <laughs> of how good God has been. To all of us. Amen. He is worthy. Of all of our praise.
we're touching and agreeing. According to scripture, where two or three are gathered together in my name, oh yes, his name, we're honoring not only his word, but we are honoring his name. God said he will be with us. Thank you, Father, for your word. Have mercy now on each of us, O oh God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out every single one of our sins. God, we know that you're able. Thank you for the gift of forgiveness. You told us, God, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us of all of our sins. We've been lackadaisical. We've been uh, slothful. We've been lazy. God, we, we've been selfish. We've been resisting. We've been rebellious. We've been dishonest. We've been liars, oh God. We, we, we've been haters. We've been all of these things, God. And yet we call ourselves Christians. So forgive us. We've pointed the fingers of others when God, every finger points back at us. We've looked down on others. God, and forgot the, the power of grace. We pick and choose when we want to come to church. We're happy when we feel blessed. God, we, when you bless us with money, when you bless us with a promotion, we, we, we praise you like we lost our mind. But then God, when the storms come, how, how soon we forget about you, God. How soon we neglect you. How soon we use these things as excuses for not being among other saints. We isolate ourselves, God, when we ought to be around the community of believers. For the promise of your word, we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses. We keep letting the devil beat us down. We know the battle is not ours, God, but we, we keep giving it over to the enemy. We throw in the towel. We give up on the church and on you. And we, 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 God, we don't, we think it's the people, but it's not the people as much as it is us. <laughs> we, we, we forget, God, that we too have some issues. That we too bring some stuff into this. That all have sinned and come short of his glory. God, so we ask for your forgiveness. We're being real with you, God. We, 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 we know that you know already. But God, we need to tell you all about it. We want to be honest with you, God. We've messed up. We haven't been all that we should have been. We haven't done all that we should have done. We've messed up. We've used this pandemic as an excuse for not being who we are as Christians. We've messed up, God. And God, you've been good to us, kept us, protected us, put food on our table. <laughs> oh, God, we thank you right now. Kept us safe from all hurt, harm, and danger. Help us now, God, to appropriate your word and, and do better. Be better. Live better. We thank you right now. We promise, God. Don't say this if you don't mean it. We promise God to walk in faith from this moment on. We, we promise to practice by living out our faith. In Jesus' name. Come on, say amen. Give God a hand clap of praise. I need the old I need thee every hour. I need thee, oh, bless me now, my Savior.
Give God a hand clap of praise. 